So, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, first meeting of the year for the British Society uh, for the History of Pharmacy. Uh, we've got about uh, 130 people uh, signed up this evening, which is great, from around about 20 countries, I think. So, welcome to all of you. Um, so, as I'm just going to share my screen and bring up a very short PowerPoint. Okay, can you see that slide? Oh, that's a reasonable size. Oh. <laughs> The captioning is working. Uh, so welcome to uh, this evening's panel. Um, and it's prompted in part by uh, a special issue of uh, Pharmacy in History, the journal of our sister society, the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy in 2019, looking at the future of pharmacy uh, history. Um, and we thought it, it would be good to, to take perhaps a, a new perspective on this. Uh, two of our panelists this evening were in fact uh, authors uh, in that issue, but I think there's a lot that we can expand and draw uh, from it. And in terms of our scope, uh, there's a very nice chapter by Stuart uh, Anderson, perhaps the doyen of uh, pharmacy history uh, in the UK, where he defines pharmacy history. It says that the heart of pharmacy history are the connections between uh, a patient, a remedy, and the maker or supplier of that remedy, and how each has changed through time. That's the broad definition of pharmacy that we're taking, starting with zoopharmacognosy, with uh, animals self-medicating, uh, through prehistoric people, through the evolution of modern uh, pharmacy in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, up right up to the current day and contemporary uh, history. Uh, just a brief word about the British Society for the History of Pharmacy. You can visit our, our website at bshv.org. Uh, if you enjoy this meeting and you're interested, please consider joining us. It enables us to organise more events. Uh, if you're elsewhere in the world, have a look at the International Association for Societies for the History of Pharmacy at histfarm.org and look at what your local society is organising. Uh, our next meeting is on 22nd of February uh, on Unlocking the Medieval Medicine Cabinet. You can find details on our website. Our annual conference will be in March. So I'm coming back to the panel now, and I'd like to introduce, uh, ask our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. So close down my other screen. Uh, and to uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their current research projects and perhaps where they situate themselves uh, in the discipline. And um, Bryony, I'd like to start with you. Thanks, Mark. And it's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, my name's Bryony Hudson. I trained as a museum curator and really came into pharmacy history when I took over running the Royal Pharmaceutical Society's Museum in London in 2002, which I did till uh, about 2010. Since then, I've been a freelance museum curator and a pharmacy historian. Um, my main publications are quite wide ranging. I started off um, being inspired by the collections at the Pharmaceutical Society, um, edited an illustrated catalogue of their Del Delfware drug jars, um, worked with others on a, a, a volume about popular medicines, patent and proprietary uh, remedies. But more recently, I focus predominantly um, where the clients want me, because I'm a freelancer, of course, and that's interesting in itself. Where do the clients want pharmacy history done? And that's in pharmacy education. Um, so um, my last, well, my last two publications and my current one are on the history of pharmacy schools. I'm currently working 
on a, uh, a work for Sunderland School of Pharmacy, which celebrates its centenary this year. And as a museum curator, my main interests are trying to engage people with the material culture of pharmacy, whether that's through exhibitions or through online um, material. Um, so um, I wear quite a lot of hats. Um, just also to mention that as well as being a past president of BSHP and a member of the International Academy for the History of Pharmacy, I'm also current president of the Faculty of History and Philosophy of Medicine and Pharmacy at the Society of Apothecaries, um, where I co-direct a History of Pharmacy introductory course uh, with Stuart Anderson. So fingers in lots of pies. Thanks a lot, Bernie. Yuanda, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Oh, hi. Hello. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I'm what you call an early career researcher, um, but a very mature early career researcher. So my background is in science, um, arts and um, history of medicine. Um, I would say my interface with pharmacy is through um, my PhD, where I looked at um, cannabis as a medicine. So I'm interested in looking at the trajectories that that will um, take me on. Short and sweet. Great. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing uh, more about that. Uh, and Anna? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Greenwood. I am, what am I? What am I? I am a historian of health and medicine and society in the modern period post um, 1850. I'm associate professor at the University of Nottingham. Um, I'm a bit of a newbie, really, to the history of pharmacy. I came in as a more general historian of Western medicine in society that previously was always looking at the history of Western medicine as it was enacted and um, applied within the British colonial project. But in... Um, as I got older and wiser and um, international archives became more tedious rather than more exciting to visit, um, I refocused a little bit closer to home and I was given, um, it wasn't given, I was offered to come and have a look at the, um, the Boots archive in Nottingham, which is obviously very near um, where I work. I wasn't sure initially if that archive would offer me a way into my um, interest into colonial and Commonwealth history, but actually it was remarkable and it taught me a lot about the history of um, retail pharmacy worldwide. And I had a Wellcome Trust project between 2016 and 2017 that looked at Boots, biggest, Boots as, as Britain's biggest retail pharmacist, um, looked at it um, in terms of its interface with the colonial world. I've taken that further. From the 1st of June, I'm going to be leading a large AHRC grant um, called Chemist to the Nation, Pharmacy to the World, very grandly. I can't remember what it's about because I applied for it so long ago, but basically it's um, a history of health and beauty as seen from local to global. So pharmacy is one part of it. The history of pharmacy is obviously a huge part of it, but the project is a bit wider in its conception in terms of looking at how ideas of health and beauty were exported globally, but also how um, a quintessentially British company imbibed global influence. And I think that has a lot of repercussions really when thinking about the history of pharmacy. So hopefully I present fresh eyes, or maybe not. That's me. Uh, th thank you very much. And we'll be returning to themes that you've all mentioned uh, a little bit later on, uh, including, I think, that the very idea of the subject of pharmacy history, we might even return to that at the end. Uh, so I must also mention uh, Selina Hurley from the Science Museum, who's unfortunately being pulled away at very short notice and can't join us uh, this evening. Uh, but we're only uh, um, I'll be speaking a little bit about some of the science museum projects perhaps and uh, as we carry on the discussion. And I'll introduce myself, uh, Mark Nesbitt. I work at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. I create the economic balcony or useful plant collection. And within that are around about 25,000 
free drugs and materia medica dating from Egypt uh, to the current day. And uh, part of my role is both to do research uh, and to facilitate and encourage research using our collections. So this evening's exercise is a purely selfish uh, one in gaining ideas uh, and excitement about future possibilities uh, for ways that we could take the collection. Uh, but some of the current work that we're doing uh, with Kim Walker, a uh, PhD student, uh, we wrote this book, Just a Tonic, A History of Tonic Water, which is a, a palatable way of presenting the, the history of quinine and the history of Sinchona and all of the uh, package of uh, history uh, that goes with that. Uh, but I'm really keen to expand use of our Materia Medica collections, uh, no, not just as illustrative material, but as a research resource in its own right, uh, particularly taking into account perhaps the new demands now of any institution that holds global collections and what the implications of that uh, are. Um, I realized that I skipped over one or two bits of introductory matter. Just a reminder to you all, that if you hover your cursor over the bottom of the screen, you'll see closed caption. Uh, so if you would like subtitling, uh, click on that and choose uh, show subtitles. Um, if you use speaker view, then whoever's speaking should become larger uh, on your screen. Uh, we have a chat bar. Again, you can click on chat in that bottom line. Uh, and please do uh, type in comments and questions there. And my job as chair will be to try and blend in those and your responses to what the panelists say and try and blend those and feed them back to the panelists uh, as we go along. And if we skip over a subject, we may well return to it uh, back at the uh, end of the conversation. And we're planning to finish uh, about 7.30, but if the conversation is going well, uh, I will run it a little bit later. Um, please remember to keep yourself muted uh, um, in terms of sound, but not in terms of comments uh, throughout the meeting. Um, so I wanted to kick off by asking, uh, and perhaps I'll start here with you, Ando, because I think your work is, is really relevant to this. Um, how, how is the history of pharmacy relevant to current day concerns? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it's something I've been pondering about also, um, because this is, um, Although I did history of medicine, I was always thinking of a way in that there should be um, a way in through my own interest and through my own work. So I'm going to um, think about what um, Anna said about her research in, in Boots to when you think about pharmacy to actually just break pharmacy down into themes about health and well-being. And if you think about health and well-being, how big an industry health and well-being is and how well-being is shifting, um, shifting to kind of lifestyle, you know, where you've got uh, vitamins, um, you've got CBD. I remember when I first um, went to Holland and I, I was given a presentation in Leiden. And I went to a pharmacy, a very old fashioned pharmacy. I love the, I, um, I love the old fashioned pharmacy. So uh, you don't see many of them here unless you go to Baldwin's in South London. And I walked in and I saw CBD. That was in like 2016 and you couldn't find CBD anywhere. And I went back last year and I just went to ask the man. I said, I bet you've made lots of money. And they said, oh no, we didn't. We just um, were retailers. <laughs> so. Um, it's very broad. I think um, the history of pharmacy is, um, is limited by its imagination. So as a starting point, where do you want to start? Health, beauty, well-being. It's, that's just the answer to that. That was what I, you know, it's very, very broad. But I think to start to really conceptualize that, I, I think I'll turn the question around and, and ask, um, what does the society want to do with um, its positionality in, in being a leader in this area? So I'm answering a question with a question. 
<laughs> That's a good question. I think we, we, we which is a, the point of holding this panel is to help us, I think, arrive at an answer to that. We might again return to that very good question a little bit later. But I'm going to just press you a little bit harder on your PhD work on cannabis, and you've been running a, a really uh, <laughs> my phone. Uh, you've been running a really interesting series of uh, workshops. Uh, following on from the PhD about uh, medicinal cannabis. Do you think that uh, you know, it's obviously a, a subject in which there are many varied and strong opinions? Do you think that understanding you know, the recent history of cannabis, let's say the last hundred year cannabis, role of cannabis in medicine, is a way of um, enabling conversations that are otherwise hard to have, for example? Actually, no. It's it's really it's it's really counterintuitive that um, in the real world, you know, that's why I started running these seminars. When I first started doing my PhD, I had so many opportunities to meet really influential people, policymakers, and I told people I was a historian. And for two three years, no one took me seriously. And then I didn't use the term historian. So when people, it's just about understanding language. When people hear you're a historian, they don't see the relevance. History really, in the, you know, when I say in the outside our, you know, bubble, people don't see that relevant. So I don't even use history. I use um, maybe history to say um, I, um, I use history uh, as a as a lens to understand things. But for uh, for my PhD was interdisciplinary, and uh, <laughs> and there was one was my supervisor. <laughs> Was my examiner it was very um it's very interdisciplinary that there was science there was visual culture material culture it was kind of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary to tease out um the trajectories of this plant uh one of the workshops i actually um run was it's just the plant so all these layers are kind of very confusing How, what would you th think of if it was yarrow or chincona so I would say probably not uh, as, as a forefront. I think one people, people need to understand the science, really. People need to understand the policy. People under, need to understand the politics because there's, there's a lot of confusion around it. And people really need to understand that um, the people driving this are not necessarily um, academics. They're influencers. They're lifestyle people. So I think one needs to understand the whole ecosystem. Uh, but I wouldn't say within that, they're kind of interesting questions um, that one can uh, idly ask about um, this area, but they're also very pressing questions that um, it's not history that you pull out of the hat. There's a challenge for historians. Uh, so, Barone, um, I'm going to ask you maybe to think a little bit about the reaction of museums to the the, the, the current crisis. So you can see the legacy of polio, for example, in museums uh, up and down the countries. It's very clearly visible. Do, do you think COVID will be as visible in the future? Are, are museums working to collect the COVID era? Yes, they are. And what I think is really interesting from what Yuanda was just saying is um, trying that, that being a historian doesn't necessarily get you invited to the conversation. And of course that's writ large for museums, but suddenly if you've got a medical collection at the moment, then you know pharmaceuticals, vaccines, regulation is at the forefront in the public eye more than it's ever been. I mean, who would believe that the MHRA CEO would be, you know, thoroughly questioned by journalists and we'd be looking at, you know, production issues around um, pharmaceuticals. And big museums like the Science Museum, if Selena was here, she'd be telling us, obviously, are right there trying to work out how best to reflect that. And um, I can certainly share in the chat, they've been doing a lot of um, work looking both at what they might collect now, what's ethical to collect now, because you don't want to start diving in um, and uh, getting in the way of all the work that's going on um, in the NHS, but also how maybe to reflect more long term. And then, of course, across the country for smaller museums, um, then they're looking at how they might reflect the experience of the pandemic within their community, whether they're a pharmaceutical museum or not, and perhaps more not than if they are, um, you know, what impact have they had um, in what, what impact has the pandemic had in, in their local community? So I think 
certainly it brings pharmacy history or at least you know the history of vaccines and pandemics to the fore um, in a way that hasn't it hasn't happened before and therefore people are thinking about medical and more specifically pharmacy um, collections museum collections than they have ever before mm. i think the science museum made a great play didn't it of getting the first vial of a covid vaccine and that's uh I think, you know, think about the, there was a some crisis of faith in museums, wasn't there? You know, perhaps 20 years ago about do, do you need objects in museums? But there is something about the authenticity and the connection of, of uh, e even as a contemporary object so of that uh, uh, material. But it is, I guess, interesting to think about how visually COVID could be represented in, a, in an exhibition. Um, would you give all of the all of the attendees and masks aware, where we might of course all be wearing masks anyhow in the future. Yeah, in, in terms of contemporary collecting, I mean, the Science Museum is collecting Christmas cards and greetings cards and postcards that have taken COVID up as a, as a theme um, to look at that broader cultural resonance. Um, so I think um, you know, lo looking at the impact way beyond the vials um, is something that is being grappled with you know, as, as we speak at the moment. Mm. Great. No, thank you, Bryony, and, and thank you too to Florian for emailing to alert me to the fact that uh, the, the chat bar was off. It is now uh, on. And I think actually this, uh, I'm going to forward the questions straight on to Bryony from uh, Anita White, uh, which relates to what you just said, would collecting photographs be a way to cover COVID? Yes, I think very much so. And I think back to the triumvirate, the uh, the patient remedy supplier point that Mark made right at the beginning from Stuart's article, then clearly something that museums are doing anyway is a lot of co-production, whether that's in a pharmacy museum or elsewhere. So to get the viewpoint of their community, whether that's local, national, international, their experiences of the pandemic, um, is, is very valuable and to be able to collect the context with that, which is of course the great, great value of contemporary collecting. It doesn't involve having to dig up past contexts. You can begin to assemble them at the point of collection. Um, then, then photographs are obviously a really key part of that. Absolutely. Hey, um, uh, yes, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would just mention, in fact, the archives at Q are working hard on documenting COVID, both for an explicit photographic record, commissioned photographs, uh, and people being asked to send in their own shots, um, and by asking people to write short uh, reminiscences, because well, it's the first time the gardens shut, we think, since the Second World War, if they shut even then, and it's clearly going to be a major moment in any institutional history. Uh, in the future. Um, so uh, Anna, uh, turning um, to you, how is the history of pharmacy relevant to a current day concern? Well, I've got, I've just come off listening to Matt Hancock talk about um, community pharmacists um, and rolling them out to give um, vaccines. So I promise you I won't over mention COVID, but it's everywhere, isn't it? And I think that's exactly just the hook on to what um, Bryony was saying. In a way, um, we have an opportunity here, don't we? It's for the people even that didn't think they were interested in pharmacy or didn't even think, didn't even reflect on it, just used it as medication or feel good or went into a shop and, you know, unthinkingly took a product off the shelves or um, you know, had a prescription fulfilled, are suddenly now reflecting on their positionality vis-a-vis -vis certain debates. And I think that is a real opportunity for us now, whether we're curators or historians or um, activists, actually, to get on the back of that public um, introspection where people are actually thinking, what do I think about compulsory vaccination? Not that it is compulsory, but, you know, they're positioning themselves or what do I think about, um, you know, um, the, the order of priority in which people should be um, given the vaccine? Where do I put myself on that? Who, who are the, the minorities or the unspoken people that are perhaps not getting participating in this story? And I think it's really becoming a, an active um, debate that 
as we all sit in seclusion, we're thinking about more than ever before. So it's a great, um, great opportunity, I think, for uh, all of us to really push the importance of pharmacy history to the forefront of social and cultural history of this time. Mm. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I think following and connected to that is an interesting comment from Michael Heinrich. Um, certainly it's essential to enter into this debate about what matters today, but the two core points are about informing future strategies, uh, following up on the pandemic uh, at the policy level, uh, um, but also academia, industry, community, hospital, pharmacy, it has to be driven by the relevant experts, the historians who have focus on uh, pharmacy and, and medicine, and with healthcare professionals who are confident to move in that area and in the humanities. And that um, uh, perhaps brings us to what you mentioned briefly, Bryony, around the role of history and pharmacy education is endlessly debated. But I think it's quite interesting, the last year or so, a whole wave of global events has, has really highlighted the importance of you know, scientists, uh, biomedical scientists, being familiar with, and perhaps even being confident uh, with the humanities and, and social sciences uh, perspective. Uh, just looking at the next uh, comment, uh, and we'll come to the role of pharmacists in pharmacy history a little bit later. It's a really important and also much uh, debated uh, subject. So, and I'm just going to add my own view on this, the relevance of, of pharmacy history to the current day, or indeed to the future, but amongst those collections at Kew is a big collection of uh, Indian Materia Medica from an old East India Company uh, Museum uh, in the City of London, uh, and we've just put in a, a grant proposal uh, to um, look at that together with uh, scientists at an Indian university who are an expert in uh, identif identification and the history of Indian Materia Medica. And the justification for doing that work is that a lot of the debates around medicinal plants today about whether they sit in official medical systems, uh, what they're called, uh, whether their history is evidence for their efficacy, find equal echoes in the 18th and 19th century East India Company surgeons were debating exactly this very question. And yet, these questions are always present in the medicinal plant community. And I, I don't think they're discussed enough. And that leads to perhaps some of the problems and, and perceptions of medicinal plants. Um, so I'm hoping that by one means or another, we can enable that work to take place and start that uh, conversation uh, around Indian Materia Medica. And there's just a nice uh, post from Lucas uh, Rickert uh, in the chat leading us to a nature article on, on contemporary uh, collecting. So it's a reminder with COVID, with Yanda's work on cannabis, that uh, these are absolutely contemporary uh, uh, concerns that pharmacy history does. It's not something that sits in the, in the deep uh, past. So I've got another question for you, which you know, partly answered. I'm going to ask you to set aside uh, COVID at the moment. It might be an opportunity to develop also this interesting theme that's emerging that, that, that I think generally in the history of medicine, about its breadth, that it's re-identifying as in the Wellcome Trust zone state admission to a much bigger question about well-being. Um, but that recent issue of pharmacy and history that I mentioned identified a number of some really active research areas. So uh, a big pharma, and I think Anna, perhaps your work uh, sit with Boots uh, sits into that. Uh, poisons and psychoactives, you under your work sits there. Uh, and it suggested perhaps some areas that were the traditional subject of pharmacy history, such as community pharmacy and pharmacy education, where several authors highlighted as being rather neglected. I suppose I've got so two linked questions for each of you. Um, what subject excites you most at the moment? And what, you know, if you had a PhD student, for example, looking for a subject, what's a rather neglected subject that needs the, the spotlight of, of research? And Brony, I'm going to come to you first. What excites you and what needs more work? 
It's a really good question because everywhere I turn in a pharmacy collection store, I see something else that excites me <laughs> and I want to get involved in. Um, what springs from my current work looking at um, pharm history of pharmacy schools? So I'm in a neglected area, apparently, looking at pharmacy education, although I would agree with that. There's very few people looking at it, certainly in Britain. Um, one of the things that springs from that for me is wanting to drill down a lot more deeply into the student population over time. So looking at who came to Britain from overseas to, to, uh, to be educated here and why, um, where within the UK people um, chose to, to uh, train as pharmacists and why. There's very little work done on that, there's 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 some, um, but um, you know, looking, finding out about the student experiences um, and their their motivation and how that may have changed over time, and particularly women pharmacists. I didn't mention in my introduction, but um, I've done quite a lot of work on women pharmacists in particular. But you inevitably start with the pioneers, and I'm very interested in second and third generation women pharmacists in what now is a profession that is obviously predominantly female. Um, how has that grown over time? And once the the uh, the leaders um, found a chink to to uh, establish themselves in the profession, um, how did people, how did women in particular, follow on? So there's a couple of research examples, um, and uh, and uh, you know just within my my pharmacy education work at the moment. Yeah, and, and I think what you mentioned about looking at students reminds me also, I think one or two of those papers in history in pharmacy identified the, the patient experience in pharmacy as a neglected area uh, too, and one, one that needs uh, uh, more work. And I think, I mean, just as a by the way to anybody who's listening and thinking of doing a PhD, the kinds of subjects that are coming up, there's quite a few here, but would work very well for collaborative PhDs, which in the UK have special funding uh, between uh, universities and, and museums. There's some interesting subjects popping up uh, here. Um, Anna, what excites you and what is a really, to, to your mind, a really neglected area? Um, what excites me? Um, I'm quite excited by um, everyday pharmacy. I think I'm, I'm excited to knowing more about what's in people's medicine cabinets, what recourse they have to, um, to feel better, um, how it's that landscape has changed in the post-internet age and how we are now um, thinking differently about those consumer choices and expertise is becoming diversified and also in some ways eroded in, in terms of the top down and that everyone seems to be an expert and have an opinion on things. So I think that's quite an exciting 20th century change in terms of um, how everyday experience, um, in terms of with the way we relate to our bodies, the way we manage our bodies, the way we um, purchase things, and ask for things um, for our to make us feel well and to make us feel better. And I think that's very exciting um, as um, this sort of democratization of pharmacy has occurred with the fact that all information is available online if you want to look for it. Now, whether you found the right information or whether that's you've come to a slightly wacky view or not, it seems um, it isn't as is, is, um, everyone's got a right to have their opinion and so people go to their pharmacists often with an idea of what they would like and what they would like to have prescribed and that's a very interesting change um, in terms of the, the way the history of pharmacy has changed to my view so every day everyday pharmaceuticals as experience that's exciting um if i had a phd student come up to me and say what's a really good topic um i quite like to I think there's a, there's a nice research topic, and I think um, Bryony a little bit referred to this in, in one of the things she said that excited her, but there's a nice research topic in immigration and um, pharmacy. I mean, it's pharmacy is a very ethnically diverse profession. It um, is one of the professions that um, has actually got a very good profile um, in terms of ethnic diversity, not brilliant, but you know, we're comparing it to some other things. 
And I'd like to think an, an, a sort of post Windrush immigration um, sort of history of pharmacy would be very, really very interesting. And particularly why are um, Indians and Pakistanis particularly attracted to um, pharmacy? Because that seems to be a trend which has happened. I'm, and I want to know what the cultural um, legacy of that is and why that has um, particularly fed into the modern demographic. Interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. It reminded me what you were saying uh, about the degree of change at the moment with you know, internet uh, sort of self-diagnosis and so on. So there's a, a paper, I can't remember the author, but it's cited in that special issue uh, by several people um, saying that the cycle of change in community pharmacy is so fast now, where you're looking at like six to seven year cycles. That, in other words, there's a need for contemporary rapid response uh, research to, to pick up this uh, speed of, of change. Um, I think that, that connects very well. Yoanda, what excites you and where would you point a student towards? Uh, similar to Anna, actually, I just wrote down people's pharmacy before, before you, mm. you did that. Um, so yeah, it's the location, um, to shift the location from the traditional um, lens of just pharmacy, which I think is kind of constricted. Uh, and I come from the um, point of view of um, speaking a lot to a lot um, patient activists and um, picking up from what Anna said, how people take control of their bodies, but also interested in also methodologies uh, where we ask the we ask the public. So I'm not um, although we have collections, collections are very specialized. Someone like me, I do not have access to collections. So where do I start my conversations about um, health and well-being? And it's actually with people, people as, as resource. So I'll be really excited in looking at different methodologies where we invite people and we do public engagement with people as, as research. So what I do, one of my methodology is my public engagement is um, research where I invite people in and we um, come up with the research questions and they are my participants. Uh, because, um, so it's actually a change in the methodology. So we're not, we're not researching what we think is interesting. We are researching what we think the, um, the public, the, for the public to inform us more. I think there's so many, I enjoy that, that, that work more than collection, but that's my bias. Uh, and what might excite me if I did have a PhD student is just what I want to do also. It's um, kind of looking at psychedelics because that's a new class of uh, drugs that are going to come in under the radar and, and they will not have, um, they will not have all the regulation of, of cannabis because of, its, because of its own history. So uh, the, the history of um, psychedelics and uh, personalized medicine that's, you know, in the future, all these, yeah, so it's more future orientated. And to the Anna, the, the project you talked about sort of make a fantastic oral history project about, um, you know, because you can have like maybe two, three, I know, I think I know like three generation of, um, of, of um, pharmacists from Southeast Asia. Can I can I add back in just in response to that, Mark, that I, I completely a bit agree with both of you that public engagement. So so in terms of research area, I can I can define things. Public engagement is why I'm a museum curator. Um, and the fact that um, you don't have to be a pharmacist to be excited to find pharmacy relevant because of all the health and well-being elements that you both outlined, I think is really interesting. I think the fact that I can go and give lectures as I do on Delftware drug jars on ceramics and get, you know, 150, 200 people who, who wouldn't ever think to say they were interested in pharmacy history, but are fascinated in what people in the past have used and believed would work to make them feel better. I think that's a massive strength of this area of pharmacy history and one that we shouldn't underestimate and one that the current context, as I've already outlined, only can you know, build on because it's more and more relevant to people to think about their health. And therefore, I think Yes, we've got an academic discipline and that's great. And the interdisciplinary nature is also great. But the fact that 
general public audiences and readerships are fascinated in all sorts of eras and all sorts of aspects of pharmacy history is something not to lose sight of. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to say something myself and pick, link it to a comment from uh, Bettina Varig in the uh, comments, um, who draws attention about the different forms of ph pharmaceutical knowledge framed by different conceptual systems. Uh, to understand how illness and therapy can be understood as essential for historians. Uh, contribution to rationality and cultural diversity. Uh, and my, so, I suppose, naturally enough, being at key, my special area of interest is medicinal plants, which are a great subject because everybody's interested, and everybody loves plants. Um, but I think the, the underworked area is really critical long term histories of plants. We often refer to the history as a, an evidence that the plant uh, works or is uh, safe. And yet, at different points in the, its history, a plant will have very different cultural contexts. And we've tended to end up with either you know, like micro studies of, of you know, receipt books and so on. Uh, giving a lot of detail about a very particular period, um, or uh, you know, plants and sort of ethnographic present as sort of ever floating good things. And there are really good examples of, for example, aloe vera, what we think of today as this wonderfully gentle and healing plant. Uh, and yet, the history that's often referred to on the back of aloe vera bottles uh, is all about the latex, which is a bitter. Uh, purgative uh, material. And I think there's an opportunity to take perhaps if you like the methods of ethnobotany, uh, pioneered by people like Michael Heinrich, who's uh, on, on this uh, call, um, uh, which are pay a special attention to users' you know, expertise and experience uh, and to project that a little bit more uh, back into uh, history. And we're going to come back, I think, to to William's uh, comment on, on pharmacy history. It may come back to that a little bit later. Um, so this is something that all in fact touched on a little bit. We're going to ask you to, to perhaps expand or to give a case study or, or an example, if you like. But here we are, we're all, all sitting in, in Britain, um, but all aware more than ever of the, the, you know, the integration of uh, the British Isles into global networks for the last 500 years uh, or more, and our absolute reliance on those uh, uh, networks. Um, and I think, as uh, Anna perhaps pointed out in, in your paper in History and Pharmacy, that's not something that we always acknowledge in, in pharmaceutical uh, history. Um, and so my sort of questions were really framed as, as, as how necessary is that global perspective for working on pharmacy history in Britain? But if we've already answered that enough, it's, it's obviously necessary. Um, should we be thinking about decolonizing pharmacy history? And what, what might that look like? It's a difficult question. I'm going to put it to Anna first. Um, well, is it important? Yes, it's, of course, I'm going to say it's absolutely crucial because um, these are my two passions. But even if you just think about it in the most sort of mundane terms, you know, any product you, any pharmaceutical product you hold in your hand, has this global network behind it, not just the researchers that came together, the funding that was behind it, the, um, the materials that make it up, but also the way it's marketed might borrow from American marketing styles or, you know, use exotic imagery. You know, it, it's all of it is um, a global endeavor. And I think, um, it's absolutely liberating, actually, which, um, to, to see these back histories and to expose these international back histories in terms of how we reconceptualize ourselves as, um, you know, when we think about what does it mean to be a British citizen and, you know, and you, you feed back. Well, equally, with, when you look at any product, what does it mean to be a British brand or a British pharmaceutical product? there are these really interesting histories and also these, un these unknown of histories of production. 
I mean, a lot of these pharmaceuticals are produced in less developed countries by people on very low wages working in factories. And we never think about that. We just think about the high tech research and the, the big pharma making the deals. And there are all sorts of um, less comfortable histories, really, that are um, going on to make these global networks. Um, in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, I mean, it, it, it's slowly happening. We've got, you know, wonderful scholars like Nandini Bhattacharya working on pharmacy in India. Um, we've got um, Raj Singh, is it Raj? I think it's Raj Singh working also on the Indian context. We have um, we are getting perspectives that um, were inaccessible to us through, um, or inaccessible to British people, or English speakers, through lack of access to languages, lack of access to archives, which perhaps had silenced those sides of the story before. So we've got to just encourage and um, push that forward. And how we do is by education, educating you know, new generations of people who are excited by pharmacy history. And this is why this broad conception of it as part of the fabric of the social and cultural history of who we are today is so vital because I don't think it um, turns people off that they're going to do this tiny little niche thing. No, they're doing things that are fundamental to their identity. So it's encouraging students um, within the field and it's showing the relevance, I suppose, you know, to modern day debates and making sure our reading lists really forefront new scholarship um, that comes from um, the non-Western world, really. Thank you. And I think everything that you say really echoes in starting to think about work now on the Eastern India Company collections at, at Kew. Um, and the, the conversations that I had uh, both with Prakti Chakrabarti in, in Manchester, uh, thinking about early, early modern uh, medicines as part of our project, uh, but also my colleagues at the Transdisciplinary University in, in Bangalore, and the literature that they referred me to has really uh, opened my, you no, know, it's, it's uh, I guess, uh, shockingly easy to, to sit in, in a London library and see a very particular set of, of books that reflects, you know, Eurocentric uh, uh, um, study. Uh, and I, I found it really refreshing uh, and invigorating to, to, to get into the habit, as a, you already are, uh, of looking well beyond that, and looking for, for new literature and, and new ideas. Uh, Yuanda, over to you, Britain and international global context. Uh, thanks, Anna. You um, just encapsulated everything that I, <laughs> I was thinking. I, I made some notes. Um, uh, I always think um, I've been kind of immersed in decolonization for at least two years now, and then since uh, the killing of George Floyd, it's just been everything I've been doing. So it's like, yeah. First of all, I'll say decolonization is a state of mind uh, and it's understanding that uh, the way I, I always describe it is, like Anna said, it's so liberating that it's, um, it's almost like you've been looking through a keyhole and then you just open the door that you just see so many, um, so many other aspects of what you're looking at. You're looking at something more in the round and that is a win-win for everybody, you know, that um, we've been conditioned to just look at just, you know, just one layer. And we need to look, another a metaphor I use also is, uh, let's say um, you have access to go around in a circle and you just keep on just going through the edge of the circle, whereas you can go around in spirals. So it's, that's how I say it's like a, it's, it's a state of mind to, open up opportunities to look at um, uh, to look at our history and we're talking about the history of pharmacy but actually when you think about decolonization you talk about the history of humanity <laughs> I get so philosophical about about this and so so reflective uh, and I use an example anytime I travel uh, I used to I remember the first time I went to Cuba 
I was so excited and I, I, I kept everything I, I, I came across, you know, the uh, bottles, I took pictures of the bottles, you know, papers, there was something about collecting to look at and um, look at the culture and remember the culture. So the example that Anna gave of, you know, if you look at uh, just the visual culture, the, the marketing, what are the stories there? So it's, it's network thinking that really enriches everybody uh, from, and then when we look at kind of the politics of it, um, people that have been, their knowledge has been um, not taken seriously. There's, 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 there's an ethical aspect of it that now we know, you can't unknow. So people that don't understand might think, oh, what are we doing this for, the politics? But when you think, uh, when you think about uh, decolonization and what that entails, uh, how some people have not been, their knowledge has just been sitting there, languages, local culture, yeah. So there's so many layers to um, having the opportunity to um, decolonize. And when it comes to the curriculum, you'll find that actually your students come prepared. Your students actually want, they, 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 they see this treasure trove and they don't want to be inhibited by something very small. So it's the, the students I think will actually be um, encouraged to drive the agenda. So the load is not just coming one way and there's this conversation. So I think it's, um, it could be a very bright and interesting future. Um, and especially with, within this discipline because it has such a broad scope. Can I just jump in? Because I think Yoanda's far too modest to promote herself. Oh, oh. But, um, <laughs> uh, can I, um, the other thing that is really fascinating about this uh, movement to decolonize is also talking about um, histories of some subcultures. And I think sometimes they get subsumed under these more official top-down narratives. And Yoanda does some wonderful work on Rastafari and, um, cannabis, which I just found utterly mind-blowingly liberating, actually, again, using that word, because those, those interviews you did to hear about the Rastafari um, relationship with cannabis um, and how those have never been heard before and um, are ones that we might overlook as not quite, you know, serious or, but it's absolutely foundational, of course, um, to the Rastafari religion. So it just hats off to you, Yuanda. And if you want to say a couple of words about that, I think it would be fantastic. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, we're, I have to say, um, before I started doing that, doing my PhD in cannabis literally changed my life in so many levels. So um, although I'm black, uh, I had never spoken to a Rastafari, even though I'd lived in London. I don't know why I'd never out of curiosity so even just ask, you know, what's, you know, I don't know. So um, for me, it was such an eye opener, just even uh, sitting down and um, having, uh, so within Rastafari um, culture uh, and through the interviews, you get to know what it's like being black in the seventies. So you get a history of, uh, of England in the seventies, which, you know, <laughs> unless you've just recently watched um, some of the programs on telly, you know, I'm, sorry, I forget we have an international audience here. I, I, yeah, so um, through interviewing people, oral histories, you get to get the social history, but also um, Anna's right, you would not get to get a real understanding of how the history and how their culture and what their, what, what meaning they attribute to, to cannabis and for them to explain the spirituality of, um, it's almost like Buddhism, you know, that for them, uh, the herb, they don't call it cannabis, the herb is just one of part of their pharmacopoeia. And for them, uh, it changes their mental state. And when it changes your mental state, you can, you can have this oneness with, with, with yourself, with other people. So you have this, um, uh, feeling of well-being and they believe that ripple effect has a ripple effect on the community to her, to um, heal the community but also to heal the planet and it's something that which people wouldn't 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 understand or would not attribute attribute that level of spirituality to their thinking and uh, yeah and just to say that not everyone that has dreadlocks is necessarily Rastafari 
So uh, yeah, so I, I learned a lot just through, just understanding and and talking. So it's back to this decol decolonization. It allows us to have these dialogues. And my, my analogy was I, I could have had the dialogue, but I was in my I was in my little bubble looking through the keyhole and just opened uh, the door. So thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that, that was brilliantly put, uh, Anna and Yuanda, uh, the, the liberating effects of de decolonizing. There's a, a lot to, to think about and to energize us. There. But only, so we, we've touched a little bit on the international aspect of pharmacy uh, uh, schools and the students coming to them, but are there other, other areas that you've encountered in your work? Yes, ab absolutely. I mean, I don't really know where to start. Similarly to the other two speakers, it's this sense of unpacking, both metaphorically and in a museum sense, obviously physically, all of the connections, all of the networks, all of the untold stories, which is clearly a big movement within museums in terms of decolonization, but within pharmacy collections. I mean, just to pick two examples, if you open up a 19th century medicine chest, where did the wood come from that made it? You know, what, what every single door, every single bottle, there's a story of network, there's a story of trade, there's a story of the interplay between Western and native traditions. I mean, Mark, your store is one enormous medicine chest in one sense. So, you know, it's writ, it's writ large there. So that's one example that springs to mind. The other, which perhaps is less um, obvious um, is my work um, a few years ago now on Delftware drug jars. So again, you know, beautiful ceramics, but if again you see those as representations of um, the pharmacopoeia of the time, you've got the containers, you've got their emulation of Chinese porcelain, there's an enormous story to tell there about ceramic history and trade and influences. Um, and then each one has a label on it which tells you what it was intended to contain. And again, like a 19th century medicine chest, every single remedy, every single ingredient has got a global story. Even, you know, the more esoteric ones, you know, we st we're still unpacking actually even what they were. But if you start to look like at something like Theriac, which had upwards of 60 ingredients potentially, think of all of those networks, all of those stories, all of that that you know, production and then how those all came into the country. I think Patrick Wallace is on this call and some of his early work on, on those, um, those uh, supplies coming in through the London docks to be contained within those pretty ceramics. Um, there's, there's masses of decolonization work to be done just within those types of objects. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. It reminds me of a little bit of work that we're uh, helping with in a small way at the queue with colleagues in Cambridge on the Thomas Clarkson chest at the Fenden Museum in Wisbeck, that many of you will know, uh, used by a campaigner against slavery uh, full of um, natural products in West Africa and used uh, in the uh, late 18th century as an inspirational tool uh, to show that there were alternatives to, to slavery uh, and then used today as an inspirational educational tool, particularly since 2007. And yet its contents, uh, which include a whole whole range of uh, plant products, uh, have never really been studied in, in detail. So they are for the first time as part of a, a community project. And it's, it's worth, uh, Brian has already mentioned this, but I think one of the strengths of museums is as a, a site for co-production, as a site where if you're going to do oral history, for example, um, they, they can work uh, very well in setting uh, the very community-based um, museums. Now I can see we're coming up to the formal end, so I'm going to skip over a uh, final question on the role of, of archives and museums because we've touched quite a lot of those in other questions and come to a more uh, uh, conceptual question perhaps, which is about the role of the uh, British Society for the History of Pharmacy and similar societies, um, which have been changing. And I think Brian and I have, have seen this change in the last few years from being very much the domain uh, of pharmacists who bring enormous knowledge and expertise 
um, to the history of pharmacy, including, as you pointed out, Peroni, in an earlier conversation, the ability to actually understand uh, Matera Medica and understand those cryptic markings that you often find on them. Um, but the, the society has been broadening its membership, uh, broadening its attendance at its meetings and the range of speakers, uh, very much situating itself as a broader part of working on perhaps in the history of medicine or the history of well-being. So this is something for you to answer in any way that you like. Um, but I suppose the, the questions in my mind are, as a vice president of a society, what could we do, be doing practically to advance all of these really exciting errors that we've been hearing about? And you know, does, does the history of pharmacy, does it have an identity in its own right, or does it sit somewhere fuzzily in a broader history of well-being? These are tricky questions. I know that Brony has been thinking about these for many years in the museum context. So I'm going to start off with you first. Thanks, Mark. Really tricky questions. And one of my hesitancies in calling myself a pharmacy historian has already always been that I'm not a pharmacist. If I need to understand medicinal chemistry or um, how to read a prescription, then I need to or I oh, in, you know, need to turn to someone with that knowledge. So the, the relationship between pharmacists and pharmacy historians and wider historians of um, healthcare or medicine or whatever we want to call it, I think are really quite complex, but in a very positive way. So I think the complexity of the field and if you like, the fact that it's quite dissipated is actually something we can see as a strength but that then links into making sure that communication between the networks, between the contacts is strengthened so that people know where to turn. So for example, um, you know, as a museum curator, Yuanda saying, I don't know how to turn to collections. They're not the thing I look to, makes me feel that we should be reaching out more. And as a museum curator, that's always what you want to do. You're a facilitator, you want to bring people in. You want to introduce the pharmacy student to the practicing pharmacist, to the pharmacist of um, trade. You want to get those conversations going and a forum like BSHP or the International Society or the American Institution, I think needs to find ways to continue to build on those conversations to facilitate those connections. It's, it's like matchmaking in a way. And I don't have the answer. I'm no sat in the Pharmaceutical Society Museum. We used to wish that there was a light that would glow when people were talking about things we could help them with so that we could say, yes, we've got that in the collection. Um, but the reality is that pharmacy museums and museums more generally are, are massively underfunded and therefore it can't all come from museums going out. We've got to find ways of doing that matchmaking, I feel. Um, and I'm always, always interested to hear from people with ideas about that. Yeah, no, thank you. So I think you know, there is a definite trend perhaps for our, our society moving towards more and more collaborative meetings as indeed our, our next one is and that's perhaps something that we should uh, expand i mean a group such as the, the herbal history uh, study group that align intersect very very closely and interestingly with us now i'm just going to catch a, a couple of posts before we go on to yuanda then uh, anna um so on that topic about international and globalization. Uh, Twina Peters right, um, points out across the current transoceanic global turn and the production of pharmaceuticals uh, makes uh, you know, that needs to be set into the context of history. It makes the historical work uh, quite quite urgent um, uh, to to understand and actually to see uh, what is uh, happening now. Uh, you know, history is, is a tool for understanding the present. Uh, Michael Heinrich um, points out decolonizing will also require us to include local and traditional medicines and uh, medical uh, practices, uh, including herbalism. So absolutely, and I think in our certainly in the society's eyes, all of these fall 
within the history uh, of pharmacy. Um, and then just picking up something Yuanda was uh, mentioning, oral history, which I, I think is um, there's some great suggestions like methodology coming out here, and oral history is rising. It's, oddly enough, it's one of these things that I, uh, <laughs> my overseas field work, if you like, is based around talking to people. When I come back to Britain, I start working on objects. Uh, I should be doing, should be talking to more people in, in Britain. I will definitely be changing my uh, practice. Uh, so Cecil uh, Brinkman uh, says collections using material objects. In Norway, we have started collecting stories from seasoned pharmacists. My life as a pharmacist I started in collaboration with School of Pharmacy. And I think the oral history is something that you know, 10 years ago required heavy, expensive machinery, uh, where it was very difficult to store. It stored it on CDs or tapes that didn't pay back like it's later. And uh, suddenly there'd be real technical steps to make oral history easier to achieve, perhaps even with student projects. And um, certainly something I think all of us uh, collections should be thinking more about. Coming back then to the future of the history of pharmacy and where what role perhaps in society, similar societies could uh, play in it. Yuanda, do you have any thoughts? Yes, listen to what Brownie said. I was just thinking, oh my God, uh, something like uh, you guys need, need a film. <laughs> you need something visual to say this is what, this is what the society is about. Mm. And it really lends itself really to um, doing like a, a short film. So that's one to get the message out to people. <laughs> that's one thing. Um, I think the future always thinks like the future needs to be broken down into okay, in two years' time, in five years' time, because the future just seems so 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 abstract. Um, to, and there's so many pop, so many possibilities. But one thing that um, that did come to mind when I was thinking about is this thing about um, collaboration, and actually collaboration with um, a broader set of people, not the usual subs um, suspects, you know, how would our conversation here has, has made me think a bit more, you know, about how broad pharmacy is and how you, we can interpret it. So collaborations with people, I think when you bring people in that are new and come with fresh eyes and fresh ears, they can actually invigorate and, and take take us on a new journey so that would be something to explore so um yeah collaborations with physicists or musicians or filmmakers uh, to invite just have like a, a kind of a round table and say what do you think we could do like a project to expand or expand what we do because what we think we're doing and what the public might um, perceive we're doing are two different things to yeah, collaboration, conversation, uh, yeah, and explore the unknown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There's some great ideas there. Re just return back to the, you know, the position of the historian, if, if you like, um, and how we present and, and define ourselves. Anna, over to you, the future. Um, not terribly much to add. I mean, I'm, apart from just here, here to both Bryony and Yuanda. I mean, absolutely. Um, and it's to make sure, I, I don't know how possible it is, but a lot of things that are branded as collaborative are actually two separate groups of people speaking, um, but not collaborating. So you have the talk by the pharmacist, the talk by the historian, the talk by the policymaker, and we all go, oh yes, aren't we all interdisciplinary? And it's not really um, even that, so things like um, little, more maybe, more maybe jigging up the format a bit as well. You could have the tr more traditional lecture format, but also have a little session in the afternoon, for example, where you do have more exchange or you encourage a joint presentation or a round table. We, I mean, it, it helps everybody. I mean, historians, just speaking as a historian, want to work with real, in inverted commas, pharmacists, because they understand the science and we can demonstrate impact and knowledge exchange and all those things that the university managers want us to show that we've done. And I think we can enrich um, maybe 
modern pharmacists understanding of their role in society by giving that longer longer trajectory of history and showing um how um important and purposeful what they what they do is in terms of the long durée the longer um span of history so there's lots that can be done but the challenges of course um is a real dialogue and uh, I'm not putting up walls because I mean I've, I've worked on many interdisciplinary disciplinary projects and um, often I found we're just saying our own thing um, but we're not actually working together so perhaps thinking about question and answer groups or putting people in pairs to have to work on a, a topic and come up with something or doing little like a, in a podcasts where you get both perspectives both people um, talking on the same topic so would be great but um and do i think pharmacy history has an identity i think that that hasn't really been answered and i think we've talked about a very inclusive um and very broad um definition of the history of pharmacy as if that is somehow um making it more palatable um and sort of seeing it in the context of society more broadly and that is absolutely necessary but I would say um, it, that doesn't negate the use of a label for the field. And that label, um, even though we, we want to be inclusive, we want to be broad, we want to decolonize, we want to explore aspects on all um, uh, repercussions on all areas of society. I think it is a nice delineation of a broad thematic um, area that is discrete. And I think it gives us, albeit a fuzzy and a broad boundary, it does give it a, a, a sort of remit for our topic of discussion that we do want to hold on to. We don't want to just subsume ourselves into medical history. You know, because there are things that are special um, and there are things that are unique. And so you can show that applicability and, and keep the field discreet while at the same time um, understanding that we can do it better. So thank you very much, Anna, Yuanda, and Veroni. You responded brilliantly to, to tough questions. And I think what, what's excited me most this evening is not just with interesting ideas for, for research, but actually the much more fundamental discussions around methodology and the uh, you know, changes in, in, in research decolonizing collaboration, but also the many different forms of evidence that we've talked on. Uh, museum collections I expected to turn up, um, uh, but archives, uh, oral history, uh, images and photographs, we've talked about those as well. So I hope that uh, everybody who's attended has found something to think about and i think certainly as a society we've got lots to think about and it's something that we'll be scheduling uh into one of our committee meetings uh, to talk about uh, but we'd welcome your input too if this uh conversation has stimulated your thoughts either in general or about specific projects uh, do drop a line uh to brony or myself um, or to the society uh, via our website. Um, so this talk has been recorded. Uh, it will go uh, uh, live on our website as soon as we've worked out the uh, technical aspects of that. If you want to come back and follow some parts of this uh, discussion again. And also, thank you to all of you who've contributed uh, via the chat bar. There's a lot of really uh, interesting points there to think about uh, as well. And I think I will now wrap up the evening by saying goodbye and according to where you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon or good night. <laughs>